All right, I, I think we'll get started. We have a, a lot of um, material to cover today. So uh, as I said, we're, we're talking about point stat today. Um, my name is Tara Jensen, and uh, let's get started. So um, the, the point stat tool is in the, the blue stack here. You know, this is our, our typical um, data flow diagram with all of the different tools and, and how um, the data uh, progresses from left to right. So the point stat tool is in the, the stack of tools that are the statistics tools. We've already talked about um, the pre-processing tools that you might use, for example, PB to NC or ASCII to NC to um, put data into the right format that, so the point stat can read those observational um, fields. Um, so point stat uh, is intended to um, take in a gridded field. Um, typically that would be the forecast um, and compare that to point observations. It uh, accumulates the match pairs over, um, over a defined area at a single point in time, very similar to what um, we've already talked about with grid stats. You can verify on um, one or more um, fields and variables um, based on, on the configuration of the tool. And um, then there's analysis tools to be able to aggregate through time. Um, as far as the methods that are available in PointStat, once again, this is very similar to GridStat. It has continuous statistics um, for raw fields. It has single and multi-category counts um, and statistics for um, the threshold of fields. Um, you can compute um, confidence intervals, um, it computes the partial sums for the continuous um, uh, statistics, and uh, there's methods for probabilistic forecasts as well as for the HIRA, high resolution analysis um, spatial verification method. So this is what the usage looks like. Um, so uh, just similar, once again, to, to how you call grid stat, you would call point stat. You need to pass in a forecast file, an, um, OBS file and a configuration file. And then um, you can add in additional um, uh, files that have point observations. So you can, um, you know, in essence, chain together several different um, observation sources into the same um, run of grid stats. Um, on the command line, you can manage, uh, you know, the beginning and ending time for what is the valid time for the, the observations and then um, output the output directory and, and the log files and, and the verbosity level. So um, this is all of that defined right here as well. Uh, then you, um, as far as inputs and outputs go, um, there, you know, it takes in either gridded, um, grid one and grid two um, files from, um, you know, either that has been passed through the unified post processor. Um, if you're, uh, getting data from uh, NSEP or from uh, other post processors to put it into the GRIB1 or GRIB2 format. Or the um, NetCDF um, uh, formats, um, the ones written out by uh, the pre-processing tools like um, PCP Combine. It also reads in the NetCDF file format for WARF and CHIRP and any, any um, NetCDF files that are CF compliant. Um, additionally, um, as we've um, talked about, especially last week, we talked about Python embedding. Um, you can also use Python embedding um, in the point stat tool. Um, as far as point observations um, go, besides the, um, uh, the NetCDF files um, that are written out by PB to NC and ASCII to NC, we have other pre-processing tools like Matus to NC and um, LIDAR to NC, and as well as a Py the Python interface as well. Um, PointStat also um, has an ASCII configuration file that allows you to define um, how you want to um, run your verification. The output files are um, either in a .stat um, file um, or um, optionally um, the ASCII files can be sorted by line type. Um, and we'll have an uh, example of how to do that. Um, and those are written out um, with a, um, a post, you know, appendage of um, whatever the line type is, .txt. So here's a typical data flow. Um, we've already talked about point stat. Um, we ran through last week how to run PB to NC, um, which is the you know, binary um, format that holds a lot of the different observation types. P PB to NC um, you know, writes out the, the point in a CDF um, format that, that then point stat can read in. 
So let's take uh, an example of temperature at two meters, um, so surface temperature. Um, the field here has been plotted using the plot data plane tool. Once again, we went over how to run that tool in um, session one, I think it was, or maybe session two. Um, and then uh, here's an example of where all the point observations are for temperature um, using the plot uh, point obs tool. And we'll um, have an example of how to run that um, during today's hands-on session. So once again, similar to GridStat, um, there's you know lots of things that can be configured. Uh, you can um, uh, configure, configure for the two meter temperature. First off, two meter temperature is, is typically at the surface. So um, following the convention of prep buffer, um, the message type um, would likely be ADP, um, SFC, SFC for surface, or possibly only SFC for, um, you know, only at the surface. Uh, and then, you know, the, here's the name and the level. And if you want to do any categorical um, statistics, then you have to provide the cat thresh um, in the units that are, um, the temperature is stored in. In this case, it's Kelvin. Um, and in the, and the way this is configured, we're saying that we expect the observations to have exactly the same name, be at the same level, and we want them wanted to use the, the same um, thresholding for um, the categorical st statistics. Um, there is the option to um, include in masking, um, not only you know like the full grid, but also polyline that masking. Um, if you want to mask based on only station IDs or um, based on latitude and longitude points, um, that is in the masking dictionary as well. Um, there are, um, you can specify what interpolation uh, method you would like to use uh, in a couple slides after this. I'll, I'll um, specify all the different interpolation methods that we have. Um, and if, if it happens to be a method that is looking in a neighborhood of points, um, then you can specify the width over which you, um, uh, you uh, perform that interpolation. So that gives you some control over um, how the point obs are matched up with the, the um, grid points. And then um, here are all the different output um, flags. Um, and you'll notice that um, we have our categorical statistics flags, our continuous statistics flags, and our probabilistic statistics flags. Um, and then a, a um, flag for um, HIRA methods. Um, and then uh, the NPR is the match pair flag. So this is what it looks like when you run PointStat. Once again, very similar to all the other tools that you've seen. Um, you define the um, what tool you want to run um, on the command line. Uh, you pass in the forecast, the obs file, and then um, the configuration file, and you can specify what directory you want to write it out to and um, what verbosity you want the log file to be at. Um, so this is what you would see um, if you were running it. And um, when we're doing the hands-on, with the use case with the MET plus wrappers around um, point stat, uh, Julie will point out some of this um, log, log information to you. Um, so uh, just once again, here this is here just for um, just basic um, uh, details that you can go back to um, when you're reviewing the, the presentation, but it, it just kind of groups the, the, um, the, uh, the ASCII output into um, the different uh, category types so we've got, as I said, categorical, um, we've got the, the um, continuous um, statistics and vector statistics and, and things for probabilistic and HIRA methods. Um, once again, I'll go over HIRA later on in the presentation and then the matched pairs. So there's 20, I, this, this is a typo, there's 22 column headers um, and then the line type specification. Um, uh, so uh, once again, um, as per when we went over grid stat, um, if you have um, several different line types specified, um, for example, um, continuous, um, the partial sums for the scalars, uh, multi-categorical um, contingency tables, and the statistics associated with that, um, and uh, the way that the um, configuration is set up, because we have three different thresholds for um, categorical statistics, you would have three lines each for that. And um, so you have quite a, a few um, output line types. And then um, if, you, if we were to go back, you would um, notice that there were 4,003 um, 
observations that were retained um, for the verification. And so that gives us 4,003 lines in the match pair ASCII outputs. Um, so um, once again, uh, all of the, the files are written out to um, whatever output directory you specify with um, the name of the tool, um, you know, the lead time, the, um, the valid time, and then um, if there are line types, if it's the .txt files, that um, is appended at the end. And then these are the header rows. Um, some of the, the um, options that you, you um, do have control over are things like description, DESC. Um, you can actually specify this in the configuration. Um, and this can be used to stratify your results when you're doing analysis. So we would um, recommend that you um, consider start playing around with um, the description section um, so that you can use that in either stat analysis or in any of the database and display systems to um, you know, be able to identify, um, you know, maybe th these are, um, and so one, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, events or, or um, you know, something like that. So it, it, whatever is the category um, that would help you understand what these statistics are related to, you can put in that description file. Um, so the other, the, the other thing to point out um, is that um, after the line type, that pretty much the line type um, pretty much says, okay, all the header information is done. Now we're going to have all the specific information for that particular line type. And what comes after the line type is not always the same number of, of um, uh, columns. Um, it depends on, on what the line type is. And to, to know what the output you're expecting um, uh, from any given line type, uh, you can do one of two things. You can look in the Met User's Guide or you can go back and, and you can um, make sure that you're printing out the, the .txt files so that you can actually get um, the header information so you know what those line types are. Okay, talking about interpolation. Um, we have a lot of different interpolation methods, um, everything from nearest neighbor to geographic match um, to um, Gaussian, minimum, maximum value, distance weighted mean, um, unweighted mean, median, Median least square fit bilinear. Uh, if uh, there, we, we had some examples of where there were data that were always mapped to say like the upper left um, corner of a of a grid cell or upper right or so forth. So we added all that in, and then we figured being we were adding in all these very specific things like adding in upper left, upper right. Why not um, you know give everybody an op op opportunity to hedge their bets a little bit and um, you know pick the the um, the point that. Uh, on the grid that best matches the observations. So that's the best. Um, I don't know if, if that's necessarily uh, the right way to go, but um, you know, sometimes maybe that that is a good way of taking into account displacement errors um, without having to go to the full neighborhood approach. Talking about in the vertical, um, the interpolation occurs um, uh, this way. So if if um, the obs and the the um, grid are at the same level, then they they are paired as is. Um, if if um, there are different pressure levels, then the natural log of the pressure coordinates are used, except for specific humidity, which uses um, the natural log of the, the specific humidity in the natural log of the pressure coordinates. So it's a little bit more um, refined. Um, if there if we're dealing with height above ground level, then there's um, the the interpolation method is linear um, in the the height coordinates, and then when the forecasts are at the surface, there's no interpolation done. Um, you'll also see in our examples today that you can um, provide a range of levels or a layer um, to do your evaluation over. And then um, basically all the observations that are between those two levels um, are used to compute the statistics. So um, at this point, we're going to take a break. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Julie so that we can run through a very basic point stat um, a hands-on example, and then um, we'll come back and talk about some um, debugging methods and some of the more advanced um, techniques. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and hand it over to Julie. Thanks, Tara. I just posted a link in the chat to the uh, online tutorial in case anyone needs it, and I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right. So we're going to go to session two here, grid to OBS, and we're going to focus for this hands-on on the MET plus use case for point stat. 
And so there's this reminder here to source the tutorial setup. So I'm going to go ahead and change directories to my tutorial dir and source the file. Okay, so now we should be all set up. We are going to take a quick look at the configuration file to point out some of the things here below, and we'll just run through the whole thing pretty quickly. Okay, so here we can see that the only process we're running is, is point stat, and we're going to loop by init time. And um, we can see we've got our init time format there and the init time specified, along with the init increment and the lead sequence. Um, we're going to loop over processes. There's only one process running in any case. Um, and we've got our points that config file here. We're using the points that config wrapped. Um, we've got some interpolation methods specified. The output flags, we just want the stat files for this run for SL1L2 and VL1L2. We've got our uh, OBS window begin and end time set up, no offset, our, our model of work defined. Um, regrid method specified. No prefix for this run yet, but we'll do that soon. Uh, we've got the grid specified, poly specified, the message type that we're interested in. Um, let's see here. And then we've got our forecast and observations that we're interested in and defined. And um, just wanted to point out here, and we'll look at this a little bit later, that they're the same for both the forecast and the obs. So they're specified twice. And then we've got um, the input dir set, which are relative to input base, and then the output dir specified, which is relative to output base. And we've got our template set up um, using init in the format. And we've got our output templates, or excuse me, our input template specified, which is uh, from the PBNC run. So let's go ahead and run that as is. We don't need to make any changes right now. And that ran pretty quickly. I guess it's all right. So it says it's, a, it's accessibly finished running. And so we want to go ahead and take a look and make sure we got our output file. And we did. And so right now we're going to do something a little different. We're going to go ahead and copy the configuration file over so that we can make some edits. All right, so I pointed out before how we had set up uh, the forecast and OBS and how they were duplicated information. If you do have the same information for both forecast and OBS, you can specify it using both so that you don't have to list it twice. So first, let let's we're going to go ahead and, and specify an output prefix to differentiate the output from this run with the previous one. So I'll search for output prefix. There we go. And we'll just add a run to. And then search for forecast. And here we can go through and we'll just comment these out. Oops. I can I probably faster just to get rid of them. We don't need these anymore. OK. Now I can just copy what we have here, paste that in. Oops. Need to make sure to get all of it, though. All right, so now we've specified those as both. And now we're going to go ahead and rerun this use case. OK, and you can see here, too, um, we've got information printing out each step of the way on what's happening. Um, starting with the configuration setup, the variables it's getting in, and then we can see them output here. So we can kind of check as it's going along. It's already finished running. Um, so right now, let's just take a look and see if the these files differ with the first run that we did. And they should be identical, because we just changed forecast and obs to be both. And we can see there are no differences. 
Um, that is the simplest points that use case. The ones we'll get into after this are, are a little more complicated and we'll talk about some more details in those rounds. But for now, I'm gonna hand it back to Tara for the next presentation. Okay, um, Ashley, why don't we take a couple of questions? Uh, there's a, at least um, a couple in the chat. Um, one is from Raghavendra. Um, I just asking uh, if the grid is exactly matched um, to the station location, is there any interpolation? I, um, I I was thinking in the vertical and I said, yes, you are correct. John um, came back and and actually um, you know said that uh, that there is if, if it's not exactly exactly matched that you know there still would be horizontal interpolation that will be done. Um, and then um, looks like another question is, are there any, is there any special consideration to interpolate precipitation data to horizontal grid? Um, and uh, so there is, uh, let me go ahead and, and share my screen again. Just wanted to point out, um, going back in the presentation a little bit, So there is this, um, actually, I, I don't have uh, the, the um, budget interpolation listed here. So that is actually, um, that's missing. My, my apologies for missing that. Um, for precipitation or anything that is kind of like a, a mass variable, um, we would recommend using budget interpolation. And John, you raised your hand. Yep. So um, budget interpolation is supported as a regridding option. So when oh. you're regridding precipitation data, you can use budget interpolation to do so. But okay. it is not an, a, an option for interpolating gridded forecast data to a point location. Okay. So then what, what would you recommend for using for precip? Um, I, you know, it, would, it might be reasonable to look at the mean, the average, the unweighted mean over some neighborhood or the four closest points or uh, nearest neighbor. It all uh, depends on kind of the, the verification questions you're asking. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, so at this point, why don't we um, move on because we have a, a lot of other fun things to talk about here. Okay, so, um, so I, I mentioned that um, one of the outputs um, from PointStat is matched pair data. Um, in GridStat, um, the matched pair are written out into a NetCDF um, file format because it just makes sense to, to you know, store the grid in um, NetCDF. For um, ASCII, to, and, or excuse me, for PointStat, um, it's stored in ASCII, which is, um, you know, makes it really easy to interrogate the data and, and see um, what is going on with re with regards to um, if you are not getting um, the match pairs um, that you're expecting, or if you're not getting the statistics that you're expecting? Um, but you know, when you have um, 4,000 um, uh, points, um, you know that that definitely um, winds up becoming a fairly large file. So we recommend that you you use match pair. Um, uh, have that turned on only when you're trying to debug the system and and or if you really need the match pair to um, pass into stat analysis for um, some kind of um, specific computation like looking for rapid intensification events um, and, and so forth. So um, one of the things that um, comes up routinely um, originally in, in our MET help desk now in MET plus discussions is why do I get zero match pairs? So um, we wanted to spend a little bit of time on, on how you can um, do some of that debugging yourself before you write to MET plus discussions. Not that we don't want you to write to MET plus discussions, but hopefully this will give you some tools to, to figure it out before you have to um, you know, ask for help. So um, the first thing is, um, is to look at the point stat logs. Um, uh, and, and search the debug statements. Um, and uh, if, if once you get through those de debug statements, you're still kind of not sure what's going on, you can always um, rerun your, your um, uh, 
files through PointStat using a higher verbosity level, like um, v V3 or V4, probably will give you um, all of the, the details that you really need. Um, but right now, um, debug um, two many times will give you um, much of what you need to understand um, what's going on with uh, the, especially the, the observations. Because what it does is it goes through and it tells you how many um, match pairs you found, or it found um, how many observations were processed, um, if there were any um, rejected because you had um, excluded a particular site, um, station ID, um, if there were any rejected because the ob type did not match um, what was expected, um, you know, from your configuration file that you set, um, or, you know, the, the valid time didn't match, or um, <clears throat> that the QC flag um, indicated that it was not a good value, or it was um, off the grid somewhere, or um, if there's a level mismatch, um, once again, the quality marker, um, you know, it did not match, um, or if the message type didn't match. So there's all these different things that you can um, take a look at, as well as um, uh, we do have the, uh, you do have the ability to specify how to handle duplicate OBS. So um, site ID, so look at the, the list of station IDs um, to be excluded and, and, and just make sure that, um, you know, that you have excluded what you want to exclude or you have included what you want to include. Um, you know, just make sure that the, the name for the ob type matches what your um, ob observation type, um, you know, is, is defined as. Um, take a look at the observation window because that is something that, um, you know, can be um, uh, configured uh, and, you know, depending on, on um, you know, whether you've had a very tight window and maybe you need to expand that window to allow for some additional observations. Um, to, to be available or um, that, that's definitely one area you can look at. Um, you know, looking at um, how many did it, how many values were at minus 9999, which is the, um, you know, the value for point, bad, bad values um, in MET. Um, did it fall off the grid? You can use plot point ops to look for the observations that are um, outside the domain. Um, you know, looking at the level mismatch, um, you can, um, you know, see if your observations do not fit within the levels that you have um, defined. Um, we already talked about the quality marker. Um, if uh, most of your observations have a quality marker that is not specified in OBS quality, then they're not going to be included. Um, the message type, um, if you have message type um, ADP UPA um, and, uh, and um, specified in the configuration file and your, um, your observation has a message type of ADP SFC, then it wouldn't be included. Uh, masking region, once again, just make sure that um, your observations um, are falling um, within the masking region or maybe they're just falling outside of it. You can use plot point ops for that as well. Um, and uh, bad forecast value, um, it, it would be skipped if there's a minus 9999 um, for the forecast value. And then the other one is um, duplicate flag. So um, let's uh, quickly go to that um, slide. With um, duplicate observations, uh, you do have the uh, um, ability to say that you um, want to turn on, um, you know, uh, rejection of duplicates. Um, duplicates are um, specified by the same latitude, longitude, level, elevation, and time. Um, and we re recommend using the, um, the uh, option unique um, if you want to um, make sure that you're only getting um, one observation um, within a, a particular time window and so forth. <clears throat> so here's what um, it would look like if, if uh, you had duplicate flag um, turned on and it's um, skipping a, a duplicate observation. It gives you um, all of the metadata associated with that, including the valid time and what the value was and what was skipped. So um, there's also the ability to compute um, summaries of um, observations. This is um, disabled by default, but um, you can um, choose to, um, to have um, a summary um, taken if you have multiple observations that occur within a verifying time window. So um, you could ask for, um, you know, say for instance, you're looking at the, the um, 
the for 15 minutes um, before and after the top of the hour, which is when observation should be coming in, um, you might choose to take the minimum or the maximum um, value in that that half an hour window, or the unweighted mean, or you know something like that. Um, so once again, that that is um, useful when you have high frequency data, for example, possibly um, you know like uh, um, renewable energy data, or you know something that changes fairly frequently um, within the um, within uh, you know the the time window that you're looking at. Um, so once again, this gives you an example of um, uh, using the, the summary information to, uh, to uh, come up with an observation. Um, we've, we've already kind of covered this in, in um, other tools, especially grid stats, but um, you can, um, there are several options um, that can be set um, uh, for uh, both um, fields, um, both forecast and obs, you can set them separately or you can set them all for the, the same, you know, for the fields um, uh, together. Um, if you have observation, um, I, I, if you want to specify very specific things for observations, this is the, the list of, of um, entries that can be um, set in the observation dictionary that are, are specific for each one of the observations. So you could have um, different ops quality flags for different observations, even though you're running point stat um, all at the same time. You would have to have, um, uh, you know, a different dictionary for each field, um, but you do have that option. Um, okay, uh, let's uh, continue on. Um, just talking about masking options. Um, as per with grid stat, you can apply masking regions like polylines or any of the other um, output that you get from a Gen VX mask run. Um, there's also the ability to um, identify um, a group of stations um, that you want to, to be included in the computation of statistics. Sometimes you may have a long list of stations and you don't necessarily want to include the entire list. There's maybe like 10 out of 100 that you know are routinely bad. Um, you can use also use the station, ex um, station ID exclude option for that. Um, so, um, and then there's also station ID include. Uh, also, if you wanted to, um, to specify a latitude and longitude, um, you can use that as well. So here's what some of the um, masks look like, um, you know, a grid uh, or a polyline or um, station ID um, for only um, uh, K and FX and, or else a, a list of station IDs. Um, that you pass in that's in just a ASCII format. It's very simple. You just have the station ID name and then the, um, and then the um, station IDs that you want to include. Um, and then there's the, the lat long box. So if you want to, um, uh, you know, just kind of um, be able to, to look in a particular region around a lat long um, point and, um, and, you know, include all the points in that region. Additionally, when you're um, specifying, um, you know, some of the um, interpolation and, and regridding methods and so forth, um, you know, we, we have two options for um, the identifying what points you want to do your interpolation over. There is um, the square, which is um, pretty typically used. However, especially for severe weather and, um, you know, uh, short range weather and, and so forth, um, there are times where um, uh, events are defined um, with a, a, a circular um, neighborhood, um, you know, expecting um, uh, the probability of severe occurring within 40, um, 40 kilometers or something like that. So we have added in the ability to look within a circle for interpolation and regridding and, and so forth as well. Okay, so um, one of the methods that has been developed and uh, um, I, I I'm not sure if Marion is actually on this call or not, but she is the person who published this method back in 2014. It um, does provide the opportunity for um, uh, people to look at, um, uh, to take into account the, the possibility of displacement error for point-based um, verification. Um, and so it's called HIRA, the High Resolution Assessment. Um, and uh, in essence, um, this is, you know, possibly what you're, um, grid could look like, um, where uh, the white boxes, um, the event is not occurring, the, the colored boxes are where an event is, is occurring. And say, for instance, you have a point observation and you are lucky enough 
to have that point of observation fall within um, a box where an event is occurring. Um, you may want to, um, you know, that you possibly will get um, a, a great categorical score if you have this happen all, you know, across all of your point observations. However, um, if you think about this in terms of a neighborhood, um, neighborhoods are kind of like a probability of um, it occurring within a certain area close to that point observation. And so um, what we can do is, um, uh, in essence, um, turn this into uh, um, a kind of a probability field um, and, and process the, the neighborhood values um, uh, kind of uh, using the, the ensemble continuous line type and um, compute the, the threshold of forecasts um, into the binary event or non-event, um, which allows you to, to, um, to <coughs> verify the, um, the uh, forecast kind of, once again, as, as a probabilistic forecast computing, um, you know, the, the standard um, uh, statistic and so forth. Um, and uh, here, here's how the probabilities would be um, computed. So if your point observation is, is in a, a box where an event occurred, um, you know, that would be um, a neighborhood of one of one. But if you look out um, across a uh, three by three um, range, then your, your neighborhood would be um, one of nine. And if you look out across a, a larger neighborhood, um, you know, your probabilities would be four divided by 25. So about a sixth. Um, as, as I said before, this allows for that spatial uncertainty um, and giving credit for being close and allows um, deterministic models uh, um, to be compared alongside of ensemble models and, and probabilistic um, using the, the same probabilistic statistics, um, which is uh, definitely a benefit. And, and so this was in, implemented several years ago, and this is how you would um, turn on the higher method. You would have to um, set the flag to be true you can specify the neighborhood sizes that you would like to, um, to include um, and make sure that you have um, the right uh, uh, options for making sure that there's um, good coverage and that, that you have um, valid data that you're working with. And as, as I said before, you can um, specify this, uh, the shape of the, the neighborhood you're looking, whether it's square or circle. So, um, we're going to run through um, some additional examples coming up, and um, we're working on uh, uh, the Hira um, example as an additional um, exercise that will be that will wind up being homework um, later on um, after we get done with this session. Okay, now quickly going over plot point ops, um, uh, you, similar to plot um, data plane, um, you just pass in the NetCDF file. You specify um, how you want, uh, what the file name is that you want the PostScript um, output to be written to. Um, and then you need to specify <clears throat> either um, an, the, the variable name that you want um, uh, plotted or the message type that you want plotted. Um, if you want it to be, um, in essence, um, uh, uh, plotted on a particular projection, you can pass in a, a different data file to um, have it plotted on that specific projection. Um, you know, specify the dot sizes and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so there's a, a description of that. And so this is what it would look like if you um, passed in um, the sample um, prep buffer NetCDF file that came out of PBDNC and you just wanted to um, look at where all the observations of the, um, the U um, component of the wind are. And then if you wanted to um, pass in um, a data file to, to um, specify the projection that you want that information plotted on. So you can see whether your, um, your points are falling inside that, um, that uh, region or not. And that's what this would look like. So I think with that, I'm actually going to um, open it up to some questions and then we'll pass it over to Julie to do um, a couple of hands-on um, demonstrations again. Um, to the MEPLUS team, are there any um, questions out there in the chat that you feel sh we should address um, verbally? Okay. No one hopping on. I, I do want to um, open it up. Uh, are there any questions where someone wants to raise their hand and ask it specifically? Tar, I, did, I do have a question. Um, I didn't want to interrupt your flow of things, but when you were talking about 
um, the du duplicate OBS, and then within the next slide or two after that, you had um, you were recommending that you use unique. I was trying to understand where you would use unique. Was that as an as an um, option in the command line, or is that in your config file? Yeah, that's you just yeah. Yeah, it, uh, sorry, it, it is. It's in the config file. So you can you spe specify duplicate flag, ah, there um, and you can specify unique. Um, I did not do my homework to, to know what else we can specify it as. So I'm going to ask um, uh, maybe John HG or someone. No, that's, um, that's exactly what I was looking for. The, I, okay. I missed the, uh, the previous slide where you had to Duplicate flag equals unique. Yeah, I, I didn't call it out. That was my bad presentation. Um, but we can also look at the the user's guide to find out what the other options are if if okay. you want to do that. Um, no, that's fine. Thank, that thank you. I was I just want to make sure I got that part right. So. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, then I'm going to hand it over to Julie. Oh, and, and John put um, duplicate flag in the um, in the chat. Thank you, Tara. Okay, so I'm going to reshare my screen. Perfect. Okay, so before we move on to the next use case, uh, I wanted to point out something I forgot to mention before, and that is that you don't have to specify only one level. You can specify, um, you know, layers or, or various levels here, as we do here with temperature. And you can also specify the threshold, as Tara mentioned, for categor categorical statistics. So I, I forgot to mention that. I just wanted to mention that there. And then we can go on to the next use case, which is the upper air use case. So we've already uh, sourced our file. So we're all set up to, to go ahead and take a look at this. And here it says to, to view the use case. If you click on this link, you can see in our documentation, it brings you right to the use case that we're, that we're working on here. If you want to take a look at the documentation there, you can do that. And it talks about the naming convention, how we choose to name the uh, the use cases there. So if you, you know, we try to be consistent and follow that naming convention. So we can go ahead and take a look at the config file that we're using. And it points out some things here actually for us to take a look at, namely that uh, in the process list, we're going to run two processes this time, pbdnc and point stat. And we have the uh, configuration files, which are set using Parm base, which was set for us. And in this case, we're going to be looking at the points that message type ADP UPA. And here you can see again that we've got both set up for having the same for both uh, forecast and observations. So let's take a quick look at those. Oops. Oh, I've got the wrong command copied. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. OK, that's what we wanted. And I'll go down to both. Ah, spell it correctly. OK, and so we can see here the variables that we're requesting, um, all of them right there. And they're all the same for the forecast and the observation. But you could have separate ones if you wanted. And we will talk about that a little bit later. So we are going to run this, this use case. And you can see we're overriding the output base here on the command line to what we want it. OK, so that'll take a little while to run. In the meantime, we can take a look and see what the output is telling us. And let's go back up to the top quite a bit. OK, so it shows, um, again, setting up the configuration files. It shows the init time that it's preparing for all the variables that are set up. We can see those here, um, our begin window. The begin and end window for observations. And then we've got another init time specified there. The same sort of information is being printed out. Um, we can see here some things right now. We're running at the default verbosity level two. As Tara mentioned, you could increase that to get more information. But hopefully, that will give us all the information we need. And again, we see these numerical levels specified. We talked about this last time, how you can look in the documentation to see exactly what that lines up with, in case you're not sure. And we've got our name and levels specified here for the observations and the forecast above that one. 
So it, it's pretty informative giving you uh, various output uh, logging to the screen. And we can see here now, let's see, that's the pbdnc command that it's running and where it sent the output to. But hopefully it's helpful for you to review that as you go along just to make sure it's got everything you need so you can stop it if, if, um, if you've realized that you've set something incorrectly. And this is going to take a little while to run. I don't know if there are any questions in the chat that need to be addressed. Let's see. OK, so Jack says, I'm trying my best to follow along, but do those high res images shown get created at some point as part of these tutorials, or is that just an example of what could be made from the output? Oh, and Marion already answered it. Perfect. Uh, does anyone else have any questions while this runs? OK, let's see where this has gotten a little bit further, it looks like. Now we can scroll up and we can see our specific points that options set here. And one thing that I, I like and would like to mention is that, um, oops, there it goes. Well, here's another one. We've got a, a copyable environment variable for the command. So if you wanted to run this manually, to maybe get a little bit more information, or if you just wanted to run this one specific command for this PBDNC run and maybe change the verbosity level just manually, you could copy this whole statement and uh, paste it into your, uh, well, actually, it looks like you'd have to copy two because this right here sets up the environment. It's got all the export statements for the variables that you have set. And then you can run this command here. Oops, run the command where it said command for example, right here. And then you'd be able to run that directly on in the shell uh, without uh, the, the or with setting up everything you needed because it's all specified there. That makes debugging sometimes a little bit easier when you have all that information and you can run the command directly if you just want to look at the, one of the cases that you're running or one of the times that you're running, excuse me. So Julie, in the interest of time, um, maybe uh, while we're waiting for this to run, um, we could go back to the um, online tutorial and, and see what um, what else there is to, to look at. Sure, absolutely. OK, so oh, it looks like it just finished, actually. So um, okay. it says to review the output file. So we were going to go ahead and just take a look and make sure we got what we wanted. And we did. We see the stat files that we requested. And then here let's see we're going to take a look at one of those stat files and um if we scroll down uh, like it says the middle of the file we'll notice that the statistics line type starts alternating from sl1 to SL, sl1l2 to vl1l2 and so we'll look at those quickly and we can see looks like i need to scroll over a bit keep going here we go so if we look down in the Let's see, don't see it alternating. Oh, here it is. Okay, I just missed it a little too fast. Okay, so you can see here it starts to alternate SL1L2, VL1L2. And if we keep scrolling over, you can see that we have the, you know, the consistent number of output line types until um, we've got some that have more. And so that is specified. Is, Tara mentioned this in her presentation. That is specified in the uh, documentation so that you can see past the point of the headers that are, look at that again, the headers that are specified here, they'll end at some point, as you can see, and then they're specific to the line type. So that's where you would go and click on the documentation to see what it is, or as we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, what we would do here, and maybe I'll skip this part and just, um, tell you about it. But what you can do here is you can specify both. And then not only will it um, specify here, I did this yesterday. So let me go back. I see where the output would be. Take a quick look. If you specify both, it'll give you a text file and it will show you um, 
it, it will arrange the output by line type specifically. So you'll have a file for SL1L2, and it will only contain that information with an appropriate header for SL1L2, so you'll know what they are. So that's that's something that you can do if you want to group it by the line type is just to specify both. And then you'll get both the stat file that I just showed you and a text file specific to the line type that you requested. So that's what we basically do in the in the rest of the exercise. Uh, we we uh, change that and we and we get the output that we want there. And of course, you're welcome to run through that, but it it does show here the sort of uh, file name format that you'd get SL1L2 or VL1L2 in the in the file name. So as Tara said, in the interest of time, let's go ahead and, and move on to the next case so that we can get through. That'll also take a little bit to run. Um, so here we are in this case, let's see, it went a little too fast. This is standard verification of CONUS surface. And you can also find this in the documentation as well. It's one of our standard use cases. And we can go ahead and uh, see the file that we're going to use right here. If we took a look inside, we would see that the message type we're going to use is only, only SF for using only surface fields. And in something interesting or different from the previous case was that uh, here in the input template, we're going to use data assimilation in init instead of just init in the template. Um, so let's go ahead and run this other use case. And we'll see. Oops, I've got a strange character. Let's just cancel that. OK, so that's going to run. And um, we will take a look at the output files. But one thing we'll notice when that runs is that we don't get everything we need. And so we were going to do a bit of debugging so that we could show you how you can get that information. Uh, hopefully, that will run fairly quickly. Um, does, I know I went through the last use case pretty quickly with stat and both. Does anyone have any questions about that or, or anything else that we can answer for you while this runs? OK. Well, we can, again, take a look at the, the output that's being printed to the screen. We can see here in this case, let me scroll up a little bit more. Um, so before, I think we were running over init time. Now we're using valid time. So you can see that specified here. And it's again, it's nice to give you the copyable information uh, for the commands in case you'd like to run those. Just gives a lot of information about what you're doing. Looks like I'd gone too far there. Let's see how we're doing. Still running. Well, Julie, while while we're waiting for that to run, um, I just wanted to quickly um, touch on the fact that uh, next week on February 15th, um, the topic is going to be demoing um, the setup of MetPlus to run on real data um, on the AWS um, with the expectation that if we're kind of showing how to do that on AWS, um, that, you know, maybe it'll give people a sense of how they could do it on their own um uh, you know systems and so forth as well as you know highlighting um the the use of aws for uh connecting to the for example um for um NSEP data um to the big data program um buckets of data that are on aws and so forth so that that should be a pretty interesting um demonstration and then um, I also wanted to mention that I've been told that um on the 22nd that EMC um is having a an all hands meeting and so based on that we're trying to um, formulate um the plans for session 11 to be something that um you know some emcers uh can miss um you know clearly you can go back and, and pick up um the the recording of it and so forth but we're, we're we're trying to be cognitive of the fact that there's going to be a sizable chunk of participants um, in this training series that are not going to be available on the 22nd. Thank you. OK, so it's finished running. And one thing we want to take a look at quickly are the variables that we requested. And so you can see right here all the ones we requested. And if we look in our outputs, we can see that we don't have all of them. We only have the first few. So we are missing output for the requested Let's see where we are um, for the requested TCDC and PRMSL. So if we take a look at the log file, let's try to figure out why we don't have the information that we want. 
So let's. And, oops, I forgot to add the file name there. Okay. So if we want to search, if we can search for T TCDC and say, try to figure out what happened exactly. And continue on. Here we go. Okay. So it says there are no matching fields found in the file. So since there are no matching fields, well, okay, that makes sense why we didn't get any output. Um, there's nothing we can do if there's no matching field found. Um, check the the file and make sure that's accurate. Um, and then we want to also look at to, to yeah, be clear, no, no matching um, fields in the forecast file, not in the OBS. Oh, thank you. Sorry yeah. about that. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, so oops, ah, I closed it too soon. Now we are going to search for ERMSL and here we go, a little further. Okay, so here we can see that the observations that were processed are the same as the observations that were rejected, and they were rejected for the OBSVAR name. Okay, so that's that's helpful. Maybe we named our OBSVAR name wrong, and in this case, we did. So one thing we want to do is we want to change that do we do that later or maybe yes we do um i'm gonna go ahead and get that running i think and then i'll, I'll switch it back into that same directory in another window but right now let's go ahead and copy this over so we can get this run started we're going to copy the configuration file over and we're going to open it we're going to make a quick modification My apologies, I'm having a hard time typing today. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this. We're going to break up both because both are not named PRMSL. Okay, so let's save that and let's get that running and I'll switch to the other window. Okay. Oh, working area. All right. So we're all set up. Now let's go back up. And while that's running, we can look at uh we can run point point plot obs uh, plot point obs excuse me to uh, plot the obs with pmo and ensure that that is actually the name and that there are points and those are what we want that is what we want for the name so that's going to run you know what unfortunately i did not log in with the ability to display this, but we'll go ahead and convert it and I will display it on the other window when that's done. My apologies, I'm running this in the wrong window. Uh, let's see, and that is done. Over here, is it? No, not done. Uh, well, we will display that just as soon as that one is done. But we should see, it looks like we have one minute. Um, we should see that uh, we do get the observations we want once we change the obs var name to PMO. Um, and then uh, we do get some match pairs. But it is still running, so I cannot prove that to you. While it's running, are there any questions? Um, yeah, there's one question. Uh, what is the easiest way to get um, a list of the fields levels in a forecast file before running. Um, and I, I guess um, from my perspective, and others can weigh in here, um, I, I would use um, either WGRIB um, or WGRIB2, um, depending on if you're using GRIB files, or I'd use ncdump, um, you know, dash H, um, and um, to, to get a list of the, the um, fields that are in the NetCDF file. And that's what John just put in there. So with that, um, you know, we're, we're at the top of the hour. Um, 
I think, why don't we just go ahead and, oh, did it just finish running? It did. OK. Actually, let me just go back. OK, so that'll load. It takes a little while. Um, but so let's go ahead and look at this output then, this stat output while it's loading. And we can see here now we do have PMO, which is, which is what we expected. So once we found why um, the observations were rejected and were able to correct that name change, then we could see uh, that, that we did get the output that we want. And we can see plotting PMO uh, that there are data points using that variable name. That, that is what we wanted to see. So in a quicker than hoped for method that at least demonstrates um, what the problem was and, and how we went about solving it. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. So um, I guess uh, why don't we go ahead and, and uh, I'll open it up for one minute just to see if there's anybody who wants to ask a question um, verbally real quick before we um, end the session. Okay, um, if not, uh, once again, just a reminder that um, next week we're going to be doing a, a demo of setting up MetPlus um, for real data on AWS. And even though we're working on AWS, I think that um, it'll be instructive for everyone. So we encourage everybody to participate next week. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And we will send out an email um, once the, this is posted, um, not only with the, the recording, um, but also some homework. So. Thank you.